Good morning. morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church this morning. It is great to see all of you here this morning. Miss Jackie Ramsey is going to come up and share an elevator update with us. And while she is on her way up, I just want to remind you that there will be no CDC Council meeting today at 3 o'clock. one you see it this one is uh, out in this for you and then there's one as you come in the front of the church so if you haven't um, been and you haven't seen them I wanted you to see what it looks like they are heavy so um, I'm using my little muscles that I don't really have <laughs> this morning um, thank you for letting me say something Dana about our elevator project our elevator fund fundraiser which um, we're currently taking donations at 21 Allen Street, which is right down the street, and uh, we're there on Fridays and Saturdays from 9 until 2, and if you can't get there on a Friday or Saturday between those hours because of your work or whatever, if you'll call me, I'll be glad to meet you down there, especially if you have lots of stuff to donate. I'd, I'd love to meet you down there and take those for you. Um, time is fast approaching. We have three weekends left to take donations. So we really do want you to get those don donations in. And I have to tell you, um, I can't, this is not about me, it's about our church, but I have to tell you, we've got some people that have been so faithful to help me. Um, Roy Myrick and Bud Baseball, they won't even answer their phone anymore when I call them when they see my call ID number because they know I'm calling them to do something. Um, but they have been so faithful to just, uh, chase whatever it is I need for them to chase and do whatever I need for them to do. And Alsa Sanders, she should get volunteer of the year for our church because Alsa, whatever I have started to do on this project, or even if it's the soup kitchen or it's the bereavement committee, Alsa is there to do it. So uh, if we do a vo volunteer of the year, I can tell you that she would be the top of my list. Um, so many people have helped, so many people that I would love to thank, but um, I know I missed somebody. Also, um, three more weekends, um, and I wanted to mention that we started, when we started this uh, project um, two years ago, but actually when we started the emphasis on it at the end of July, we had about $105,000 in our account. Today we have $154,545,000. Y'all give God glory, because he has just blessed us so in this. I'm just amazed every time I look at the uh, bulletin on Sunday and I see how much we've grown. One week, we actually had $18,000 worth of donations given to us, and it was because we had some very, very um, dear, dear people in our church pass away and their families uh, put in, in lieu of flowers, memorials to the elevator fund. And y'all, that is just, I mean, it just touches my heart. I get emotional talking about it. But anyway... I just praise the Lord. I thank you for your donations. We need cakes. If you are a cake baker and you can bake a cake, a cookies, or brownies, we're going to need those for the sale. Um, you realize this is just a few weeks before Thanksgiving, and people would love to buy those cakes. Um, Mr. Bob Dixon has baked us 12 wonderful fruit cakes. I am. I have a list of people that want those. If you want one of them, please call me and let me put your name on that list. If you haven't had one of his fruitcakes, I can tell you they're one of the best that I've ever, ever eaten. So continue to bring those donations in. Clean out the garage. Clean out the attic. Um, men, you can do that for your wife, and I appreciate it. We all appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Miss Jackie. There are a lot of things happening at First Baptist Church this week. So let's take a look at FBC TV for all that is going to be going on here shortly.
morning, everyone, and it's a great day to be at First Baptist Church in Barnwell. I'm Kayla Peters. And I am Jesse Peters. We are a part of the children's ministry as well as the, as the children's choir here at FPC. With us are a few of our friends that are a part of what God is doing in, in His church. Let's take a few minutes to highlight some exciting upcoming events. Are you a part of the Camo Sunday School class? If so, please plan to meet in room 403 beginning next Sunday. Men, if you are not part of a Sunday class, Camo may be the perfect fit for you. Join the group as they learn more about the book of John. The CDC Council as well as the Church Council and Deacons will meet today. CDC Council will meet from 3 to 4 in room 22. At church council and deacons will meet at 4.30 in room 202. Senior Saint Sunday will be held on October 25th. If you are a senior saint and plan to attend the luncheon on the 25th, please RSVP for the event by calling the church office or by placing the check mark beside your name on the attendance register. Mark your calendars for the Fall Festival to be held on Wednesday, October 28th from 6 to 7.30, trunk or treat sign-up sheets as well as candy. Donation bins are now available in the Welcome Center in the first floor. If you are interested in serving any capacity during the Fall Festival, please see Danny Bell. Children, do you like to skate? If yes, then join the children's ministry as we jam with Jesus on Sunday, October 25th. The cost of the trip is $10 and completed permission slips as well as the fee should be turned in to the church office no later than next Sunday. All youth are invited to travel to the South Carolina State Fair on October 23rd. Completed permission slips as well as $15 should be turned into the church office no later than October 18th if you would like to attend. Great things are happening on Wednesday nights at FBC. Join us for children's choir and merge beginning at 6 and flight beginning at 6.30. You've been watching FBC TV where we're giving God glory and giving people hope. We hope that you have a great service. Pastor Keith. A couple of things, uh, November 8, a very important day for uh, us at First Baptist Church. I've called for a special business meeting on uh, November 8 at uh, 945. Now we'll make room for the Sunday School, but uh, I need everybody to be here at 945 to take a vote. We're going to vote on two amendments. One is to our Constitution to uh, change out the 1963 Baptist faith and message and include instead in our Constitution the 2000 Baptist faith and message. And also then an amendment to our bylaws to provide that uh, members must have attained the age of 18 in order to vote. And uh, so that's very important. We need a quorum of 150. I'm gonna ask you to please make a special effort instead of going to everybody else's homecoming come to First Baptist Church, actually come home, all right? And uh, let's all be there for that meeting. We've been praying for several weeks now for the uh, Global Hunger Initiative. And uh, we had set aside today to take a special offering, and we're going to do that at the very end of our service today, and I'm going to ask you to give generously. But we've also expanded that offering in light of recent events uh, we all know about last week's flooding and the people who were adversely affected by it. And so if you would like to contribute to that fund when you uh, give your check or cash at the end of the service today, please just designate that. If you write SC for South Carolina or flood, we'll know exactly where you want that to go. We're partnering with Awaken Church in Charleston, South Carolina. They're at ground zero. Uh, for a lot of the problems and uh, they're doing a wonderful work trying to address this and minister in the name of the Lord Jesus. We want to help them so we're partnering with them. We've partnered with the American Red Cross, we've partnered uh, with other civic relief organizations and churches 
Um, anything you bring, this is going to be an ongoing effort, anything you bring over the next several weeks, we have a place to get it. So all you have to do is bring it here to the church, you bring it here, we'll get it where it needs to be, okay? And uh, we've also printed up flood relief prayer guides for you. Please use those and let's pray for our neighbors who are in distress. Also, uh, on the back of that is a flood bucket for disaster relief. You can create for the South Carolina Baptist Convention Disaster Relief Team um, a flood bucket, and those would be very helpful right now to help in the cleanup effort. Again, just bring all of those here, and uh, we'll know where to get them. In, uh, in light of the fact that we are recognizing today as Global Hunger Day, I also want to uh, recognize the fact that we have a number of people here at First Baptist Church um, who are not only take caring, uh, taking care of hunger across the globe, they're taking care of hunger right here in our community. There are a number of people who are heavily involved with our soup kitchen ministry here. And I just want to thank them um, let me point out that uh, here's, here's a note that I have that says, through the work of hundreds of volunteers, several churches, and many generous donations, a staggering 30,000 plus lunches were served at the soup kitchen in 2014. And I want to promise you that that number is going to be higher for 2015. That averages to more than 576 lunches served each week. I know our group who does this on Fridays uh, they're feeding 130, 140, and up each and every week. And so I just want to thank them, and I want to thank you for supporting that ministry. If you have contributed to our soup kitchen ministry over the past year, or if you have volunteered and worked at the soup kitchen ministry over the last year, I want you to stand up and be recognized. Yeah, thank you all so much. I, I told a story in the first service, and I, I don't want it to get to you third hand, so I'm going to tell it in this service as well. Um, it's an embarrassment to my wife, but it's a true story that really revealed something to me. And that was uh, she came home after going to the soup kitchen one day because she just wanted to survey what might be there that she could use. And she came back, and she was a little hot. And uh, I could see the steam coming out from under her collar, and she was giving me that look. Y'all know that look, right? <laughs> and uh, I'm like, well, honey, what in the world is the matter? And she says, uh, you know, she tells me that th the folks that were working at the soup kitchen on that particular day that she was there were serving smaller meals, and, uh, and they had to shut down because they didn't have enough food. So Sherry still came up with the idea for Cans for Cans ministry, tremendous blessing to help provide additional resources for those smaller churches. And uh, so I'm trying to comfort my wife and calm her down a little bit and I said well honey you have to think you know there are some smaller churches that are participating and I'm glad for them to be able to do that but they may not have the resources available to them that we have and so they're serving smaller portions and they can only feed so many people and then they have to stop and we just need to be understanding about that so I'm trying to calm her down and she was having none of it and she looked at me and said something that uh, has just stuck with me because it not only revealed her heart, it revealed the heart of all those people that I know are so involved with our soup kitchen ministry. And she looked at me and she said, if I would not feed it to my own family, I'm not going to feed it to them just because they're poor. And I, uh, I just saw her heart and the heart of all those people in our soup kitchen ministry in that moment. And uh, so I just want to thank you for all you're doing. Jesus said, when you fed the hungry, when you fed the least of these in his name, you did that to him. So let's see the face of Jesus in these people that we're helping today. I'm just going to leave it up to you at the end of the service. I don't know how to divide all this out. You designate what the Lord leads you to go to flood relief. You designate what you want to go to global hunger. We'll trust the Holy Spirit to be able to sort all this out and send resources where those resources need to be, okay? Darlene Cook is going to come and lead us in our praying.
Let's bow together. Jehovah Jireh, the great provider, we come to you this morning in complete trust because you are God alone. You are a God who is sovereign and holy, full of grace and mercy. And we sit here, Lord, in your house as part of your body, very comfortable, very well fed, most of us never having known what it's like to be hungry. <clears throat> we'll leave here today and we'll enjoy a meal that is very satisfying and filling. We sit here spiritually being fed. So it is our prayer this morning that you would open our eyes and our heart, Lord, to identify with those who are hungry, to think of them as you think of them, to see them as you see them, to understand their need, and then to be willing to make the sacrifices, whether it's monetary or in some other way, in service and in love, Lord, that we would be willing to address those needs, that hunger, that physical hunger, that spiritual hunger. Lord, we know most will not ever listen to us spiritually if they are suffering from physical hunger. So let us be aware of those needs and let us be just willing to do what it takes to satisfy those needs. We have so many who have already sacrificed here in Barmel through the soup kitchen and I thank you for their heart and their willingness to serve. I pray it's contagious, Lord, that more of us, as needed, would come forth and answer your call to serve that way. But that that call would not only be answered in Barnwell, but in our state and in our nation and in our world. Lord, you know the problem, but you also know the answer. You are the answer. Lord, we just pray for an opportunity to be a part of that answer. And we thank you now for how you will use us for your glory and their good. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let us come together and count our blessings. Let's stand together and sing.
because you are great. You are wonderful. We lift your name up to glorify you. We sing your praises. We ask that you bless the offerings and bless those who give freely and joyfully in their hearts. It's all these things that we pray in your name. Amen.
Sarah is headed back to Ohio, so let's pray for her as she heads back today. All right? Thank you, Sarah. And uh, how many of you enjoyed uh, hearing that organ and thought, what is that strange and beautiful sound? <laughs> We're glad to have Jay Beasley here playing the organ for us. Jay, thank you very much. Beautiful. All right, I want to invite your attention now to the book of Revelation chapter 21. And uh, this week I hope not to be as controversial. I'll still say some things that I think uh, involve misperceptions that need to be clear up, cleared up. But last week I had to talk about uh, the millennium and uh, present my view to you that I believe we are in that period that is described as a thousand years in Revelation chapter 20. And uh, that Jesus Christ is ruling from heaven and that all we are waiting for is for Jesus Christ to come to this earth and that reign that is in heaven now will uh, come to this earth and be here forevermore. And uh, so I realize that some of you were hearing that particular viewpoint for the first time last week and uh, you had a lot to digest. But I'm happy to report this morning that uh, I got confirmation from an unusual source last week. I really did. I, I went home after presenting my view that we're right in the middle of this thousand-year reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I got home and uh, Governor Haley interrupted the program that I was watching. And she led off that interview by saying, we are right in the middle of a thousand-year reign. And I said, that's right. That's what I was trying to say this morning. Well, today, I want to talk about a new earth. Previously, what we have read is God's judgment being poured out upon all evil. The inhabitants of the world are judged. The prostitute, also known as Babylon, is judged. The beast and the false prophet are judged. Satan is judged. Death and hell are judged. And the only authority that is left standing is God's authority. The only city left standing is the new Jerusalem. The only people left standing are those whose names were written in the book of life. And all that remains is just as God originally created it. Very good. Now, chapter 20 has told us specifically of that great and terrible day of the Lord the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. When the Lord came the first time, it was in humility, in the form of a servant. When He comes the second time, He will come as our King, and He will come in power and great glory. Of His first coming, John told us, He came unto His own, but His own received Him not. But of His second coming, John tells us, Behold, He comes with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all families of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. When he came to earth before, he came to bring salvation. When he comes again, he comes to bring righteous judgment. That judgment will be completely righteous, and it will be completely final. So, some people will ask, well, what uh, happens now when we die? Aren't people judged now when they die? Don't we either go to heaven or to hell now when we die? So, what's the point of a further judgment after judgment has already been made? And that points out, that very question points out what I believe is a common misperception about the nature of of the judgment that we're talking about and about the nature of heaven and hell itself. So I want you to take your outlines and let's go through some of these introductory things before we actually get to our text because this is so important to understanding what we're reading right now. Judgment now, when we die, there is a form of judgment. That judgment that occurs when we die is spiritual. It is not bodily the Bible tells us that when a person dies, the dust returns to the ground from which it came. 
and the spirit returns to God who made it. So our bodies go to the grave, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Our bodies go to the grave, but our spirits do not. Our spirits go elsewhere. The spirits of the righteous are received into God's welcoming presence in that place that we call heaven. Jesus referred to that place as the bosom of Abraham. It's that place where God's people are welcomed home. But it is their spirits who go there. And the spirits of the wicked, we read, lift up their eyes in a place of torment. And that is the place that we call hell. The spirits of God's people in heaven live in that place that has been referred to all throughout this book of Revelation as the city of God or the heavenly Jerusalem. And it's not just in the book of Revelation. You're seeing passages in Hebrews and Galatians, if you're looking at your study outline, that also show that that place is referred to as the city of God or the heavenly Jerusalem. But at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, there will be a great resurrection and a final bodily judgment. Our spirits, which have gone to be with God, will be reunited with those bodies that have long since turned to dust. And just as Jesus' body was raised from the dead, so our bodies will be raised from the dead as well. And then there will be judgment. Jesus said, do not be amazed. A time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live. And those who have done evil will rise to be condemned or judged. So at the second coming, there will be this great resurrection and a final bodily judgment. At that time, God will destroy the earth by fire. We're told in 2 Peter 3, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. We all know from Jesus' language that when we read about the day of the Lord coming like a thief, we're talking about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That day will come unexpectedly, unaware. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire. And the elements will melt in the heat. Now, why is that? It is because sin has corrupted the entire cosmos. Sin has erupt, uh, corrupted this earth. Sin has corrupted everything in the universe because God did not put it here. It's something we put here, but God did not put it here. It doesn't belong here. It's a foreign body a foreign element in a universe that God created to be perfect. And that is why the earth itself awaits this great resurrection day. The Bible says the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies, not just our spirits, but for our bodies to be raised from the dead at this great day of resurrection when the Lord Jesus returns and the whole universe is purged by fire of sin. Now, that is precisely the event that John has been describing in Revelation chapter 20, that great day when the Lord Jesus comes 
and judgment is cast. And he says, I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence and there was no place for them. So it's, we're reading about the same thing. The heavens just being rolled back like a scroll. So, all trace of evil and all of its ramifications are entirely destroyed. They're just obliterated. And the earth is entirely recreated. Death is wiped out. Hell is obliterated. Even the earth, which has been touched with sin, is destroyed. But that destruction of the earth is not for the purpose of removing it forever. It is for the purpose of purging it forever. Eradicating forever any trace, any remembrance of sin or evil. They'll be gone. Just completely gone. We look forward to a new heaven and a new earth in which there dwells righteousness and nothing but righteousness. Now, I hope that clears up some misconceptions that people have about a lot of things. Many people, for instance, believe we're going to heaven and our spirits are going to live in heaven forever. But that's not the biblical teaching. When believers die, we go to heaven for our spirits to await resurrection of our bodies and for those to be reunited in this resurrection. After the resurrection, after the earth has been recreated, after our spirits have been rejoined with our bodies and re we receive glorified bodies just like Jesus' body, which is what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 15. I want to encourage you to read that. We'll have bodies just like Jesus' body, never again subject to death. And we will live here forever on a restored earth. Not forever in our spirits in heaven, but forever in glorified bodies on an earth that has been recreated and restored to the original perfection in which God created it. We will live eternally in glorified bodies here on this earth. It's the promise of Scripture. It's the promise of Jesus when he said, Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit what? The earth. That's exactly right. That's the promise of God. And it's not just New Testament, and it's not just the book of Revelation. It goes all the way back to the prophets. This is Old Testament promise of God. Read Isaiah 65, 17. Behold, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they even come to mind. So thoroughly eradicated as to be as though they never even existed. Ever. God's triumph so complete that there's not even a remembrance of what it was like to struggle through this world when sin had corrupted it. And that's the story of Revelation 21. The story of this new earth. John begins by saying, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. What we read about in Genesis 1, God creating the heavens and the earth, that order of things is entirely past and they are now recreated so that there is a new heaven and a new earth. Revelation 21 is the story of the transition of God's people from heaven to earth. Not to live in heaven forever in disembodied spirits, but to live here forever on a recreated earth. John says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. 
So today I want to talk about that new heaven. And I want to describe for you five things that are in the new heaven and nine things, or the new earth, excuse me, the new earth. Five things in the new earth and nine things that aren't. And we just have to move through these quickly. But I want you to let your imagination just sort of run free today. You're in no danger whatsoever of overestimating the glory of this restored earth, the marvel of its perfection. There's no danger you'll ever imagine it too good. No danger that you'll ever catch up to the reality of what it's going to be like. So just let your imagination be free today to think about what life will be like in this new earth. Let's talk about the things that will be there. The first most important thing, really not a thing, but the first most important presence in the new earth is God himself. Now, think about that. Think about our life here and now. Our desire, our yearning, our longing to connect with God. But the reality is, God is not like a man. God is so far beyond anything from our experience that we just have a hard time, don't we? And we have spits and spurts where we're spiritual and then it becomes a struggle and it's hard to maintain a certain level of faith and hard to connect with God and want what He wants even more than we want what we want. It's, it's not the easiest thing to know God in this present world. But listen to this beautiful description. And hear John say it three times as though he's so taken by this fact he can't get over it. I mean, he's just stunned by this reality. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men. And he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them. And be their God. There will be no distance. God will be right here. Not separated from us. But with us. The person of Jesus Christ. Whom the Bible says was the fullness of God in a body. The Lord Jesus Christ. Will be here to reign over all this righteous new earth. And he'll be right here. With us. We'll know him even as we are known by him. And all of this in fulfillment of the very promise of God. Listen to the covenant God makes with his people. He makes it in Jeremiah. He makes it in Ezekiel. It's quoted in the New Testament. Quoted in the book of Acts. Quoted in the book of Hebrews. Listen to this covenant. This is the covenant I'll make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I'll put my law in their minds. Write it on their hearts. No longer has to be on tables of stone for us to see. It'll be part of who we are. It, it'll just be part of us. I'll be their God. They will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor saying, Know the Lord. Because they'll all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. Imagine that. Dwelling with God in an immediate sense. Not any sense of distance. Tell you what else is going to be in the new earth. True life. Life on earth is going to be unlike anything you've known of life on earth. Can I just say it that way? It's like Yogi Berra saying, that's the most unheard of thing I ever heard of. You're going to experience life in a way that you've never known in this life, in the new world. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I'll give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Think of that. To experience true life, 
real life. C.S. Lewis called this life the shadowlands. We have a foretaste. We can still see the image of God, but we recognize that it's marred in this creation. We can still see the beauty of God, but that beauty has been marred. We can still see the wonder of God, but that wonder has been scarred by sin. Once that is eradicated, we can't imagine. Can you imagine what it would be like to walk with God in the cool of the garden the way Adam did? Just try to wrap your head around that. Go ahead. And Jesus says, I'll give the water from the spring of life to drink forever. The bride of Christ or the new Jerusalem will be in this new world. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I'll show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Now, when this angel says to John, let's pretend he's talking to you, and he says, come on, I want to show you the bride. I want to show you the wife of the Lamb of God. What are you expecting to see? A woman. What, do, what does he see? What do you see? A city. You see a city. It's just like that prostitute who is also known by the name of Babylon. Here is this holy, beautiful bride of Christ. And she is a city. It's the new Jerusalem. And it's coming down out of heaven from God. It's heaven come to earth. And as this beautiful city, the people of God, come down out of heaven and begin to inhabit the earth... Note what's happening here. They're bearing the image of God. It says, it shone, or she, the bride, it, the city, shone with the glory of God. And its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. His beauty, his glory, his light, his purity, all of that shining through this city that has come down to be on earth. It recalls the history of redemption. Here are these 12 gates and these 12 foundations. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. The wall has 12 foundations, and on them are the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb, reminding us forever with this gentle reminder that God has throughout the entire history of the earth redeemed those people who are His, whether they belong to the children of Israel, whether they belong to the New Testament church, it's irrelevant. They're all represented there in all of their fullness. Here's that number 12 that just keeps coming up again and again. And it reflects the very nature of God in several ways. Unimaginable vastness. Here's this city described for us. It's laid out like a square as long as it is wide. And he measured the city and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length. The King James uses the terminology of a furlong. Those are roughly similar measurements. Do you know how big that is? That's 1,400 miles. That's getting on the highway and traveling from Barnwell, South Carolina to El Paso, Texas. Those are just the city limits. And that's just one dimension. It doesn't just go that far West, it then is as long as it is wide. You have to then head from that little strip where the panhandle of Texas meets the border of New Mexico and head north and run right up to the border of Canada and then make a square out of that. Now you think Jacksonville is a big city. You start wrapping your head around that city and then try to add to it this. It's not just square, it's cubed. It's as tall as it is wide and long. That means it's 1,400 miles straight up in the air. We think we've done something because we built a skyscraper that's 1,776 feet tall. The new Freedom Tower. 
you could stack 4,162 Freedom Towers and still be inside this new Jerusalem that has come down from heaven and is here on earth. Now, I'm going to let you try to wrap your mind around that, but the truth is you can't. Any more than you can wrap your mind around the vastness of God himself, you're not going to figure out how big that city is. But you get the point. It's big, right? And it's got perfect order to it. It's perfectly symmetrical. Isn't that just like God? And then it's got this breathtaking beauty. I won't read all of verses 18 through 21. Read about all the jewels, all the gold, the, the great street of the city. We think of heaven being populated with streets of gold. That's not what it's saying. It says the great street that runs right through the middle of the city, main street of this new Jerusalem, is made of pure gold. And it's not like metal gold. It's like transparent glass. John's trying to, his best to compare it to something that he, he can only compare it to something that's here on earth. But you get the picture. It's magnificently beautiful. It will take your breath away. There's something else in this city. Ceaseless worship. Worship that will never end. As we were singing today, singing about the holiness of God, the beauty of what He's created, how great Thou art. As we were singing those things today, didn't something in you connect with God? Don't you want to be in a place where that will never end, where those angels, those cherubim, those seraphim, they're flying around the throne and just day and night, they're just worshiping God. And we join in that happy chorus. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be wonderful. And then there's something else that, that sort of caps it all, and that's eternality. It's always going to be that way. It will ever more be that way. He who was seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. Now, I don't want to give you a grammar lesson here today, but I want to tell you something about this verb tense in its original language. It's just perpetual. It's not like it's going to happen one time. We'd have to add an adverb to this. I am continually, I am forever, I am always making everything new. It means every second, every nanosecond, everything is renewed. Right now, the cells of your body renew about every seven years. You've got a completely different set of cells than you had seven years ago. But it's going to be that way every instant in the new world. Nothing's ever going to get old. Nothing's ever going to die. Nothing's going to age. It's just going to remain perpetually new. You don't ever have to go out and fix up your house. It's going to be just fine all the time in the new earth. It's just amazing. Now, what's not in that new earth? There are nine things here. Let me just run through them. You go through this later. Use your study sheet and just try to picture this. There's no more C. The sea's gone. Why? Because in the Bible, there's this thread that runs throughout the Bible where the sea represents certain things. The sea represents evil, the source of evil. You don't believe me? Go back to Revelation 13, 1, where that beast, you remember that magnificent beast? You remember where he came from? He came out of the sea. That's right. You remember where he stood and had his power, his source of power? The sea. There you go. That's right, Nora. Good job, girl. And uh, so there's no more evil and there's no source for any more evil. It's also in the Bible, the sea represents a source of confusion. Even, it, it's even there in the creation account. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void. It's, it's chaos. And darkness is on the face of the deep, that's another term for 
the sea. But the Spirit of God begins brooding over the face of the waters and starts separating out light from darkness and land from sea and the firmament above from the firmament below. And he brings order to what was chaos. There's no more source of chaos in the new earth. And the sea represents something else. The sea represents the source of separation between us and God. You know, we picture this placid sort of uh, like, you know, uh, there's that reflection pond in front of the uh, Washington Monument or in front of the Capitol in the mall there in Washington, D.C. And we read about this sea that is before the throne of God and we think about a little reflecting pool like that. Oh, no. That's an ocean. That's an ocean that separates other living creatures from the God who made them. And you know what God's going to do? Wipe it out. He's just going to eliminate it. There's going to be no more sea. There's going to be no more sadness. According to verse 4, he'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. There's going to be no more death. There's going to be no more crying or pain. The old order of things, things as we know it, it's done for. It'll never be the same again. There'll be no more evil people in that place. In fact, we're told in verse 8 that the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, their place will be somewhere else. Their place will be in the fiery furnace, the fiery lake of burning sulfur. That's the second death. They've already experienced the first death, having soul separated from body. Then they'll experience a second death to have their soul forever separated from God Himself. No more evil people in that place. No more temptation. No more locks on doors. No more doors. None of that will be in the new world. There'll be no more temple. You know why? God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. What is the temple? The temple is that place where we meet with God. That's done for. Religion as you know it now will be done for. We'll live in the immediate presence of God. No more luminaries, no more sun, no more moon, no more day, no more night. Just perpetual light, perpetual warmth, perpetual joy in the presence of our God. The glory of God gives that place its light. And the Lamb is its lamp. So there's no more night. No need for gates ever to be shut. No night there. And finally, no more impurity. Nothing impure will ever enter it. All of us, when we think about the creation that God made and we think about that paradise that He created, the earth that we still live in, we can't help but know that something happened there. Something went wrong there. Because yes, there was Adam and yes, there was Eve and yes, there were the animals and yes, there was the garden. Yes, there was paradise. Yes, there was the tree of life. But there was also a snake in that garden. And the result of that has been disastrous for thousands upon thousands of years now. Imagine now the existence of that garden, that paradise for us to live in. And no possibility whatsoever of any temptation. No possibility of a fall. No possibility of anything ever impure being there. No impure thoughts, no impure people, no temptations. Nothing but perpetual joy in the presence of God. Experiencing His nature, His character, His moral being. Imagine that. I don't think you can. I challenge you to try, but I don't think you can. And I just want to say to you, don't you want to be there? 
I mean, don't you want to live in this earth the way Adam lived in it? Wouldn't you enjoy a walk in the cool of the evening with God in the garden? I mean, really, actually, not metaphysically, not spiritually, but bodily, like Adam, walk with God. Wouldn't you enjoy that? I do. And if you want that place, you need to realize that that earth comes down out of heaven. That place is reserved for God's people. There's another place that's mentioned here. I didn't dwell on it because this passage doesn't dwell on it, but it is very clear. There is another place here for all the impurity, for all the evil people. There's a place for them too. And that place is as awful and terrible as the new earth will be glorious and joyful. You want to go to the new earth. You want to experience that. You don't want to experience the other place. You just don't. And so the only way to experience that new earth is to make things right now with God and with the Lamb. To go to Him now and ask for the forgiveness of sins and ask Him for the salvation of your sinful soul and the eventual resurrection of your very body so that you're prepared to live with Jesus in a body like Jesus because of Jesus. And so if you've never begun the relationship with God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I want you to know that's the pathway. That's how you get there. Thomas looked at Jesus when he talked about going and preparing a place for us. And Thomas looked at him and said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. So if you've never made things right, by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Make things right with God today by believing in Him now. Let's pray. Father, we love You. We long for this world that is to come. And so we pray, even so. Come, Lord Jesus. Come and make it so. And if there's one who's not ready for heaven or the new world that will come down from heaven to this earth, I pray that Today would be the day that they make things right to you. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll be down front to greet you, pray with you about anything you'd like to pray about or talk about anything you'd like to talk about. Share any burden or joy. You just come now as we sing. Let us stand together. Jesus is our great hope that we will live in that world to come. He has been raised from the dead, and all who share in his sufferings will likewise share in his resurrection and know that world. So you go, give God glory, give people hope. And let me say, um, those of our soup kitchen volunteers, if you would, take your places and man the exits. Be generous for the sake of those who are hungry and for the sake of those who are recovering. This is our opportunity to do that. God bless you.
blessed day.